You're listening to Foreseeable, a production of Global Is Asian, the flagship thought leadership digital platform of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Each episode, we invite an expert for a conversation relating to their field of study or experience and to find out what they foresee happening in the future. Benjamin Kashor is Lee ka Professor in Public Management and Director of the Institute for Environment and Sustainability, EYES, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He specializes in global and multi-level environmental governance, comparative public policy and administration, and transnational business regulation and corporate social responsibility. In his role as the Director of EYES, he focuses on helping governments and private sectors close the gap between policy commitments and actual outcomes through fit-for-purpose policy analysis. He joins us to help explain just how that works in the real world. Professor Kishore, could you share some of your thoughts on the way forward for building evidence and research towards stronger policymaking decisions that can better address climate change challenges, especially given the fact that climate change has forced us to no longer be reactive but proactive? and seek out answers even before the problem occurs? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's one that we in the Institute for Environment Sustainability at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy think about often. And in doing so, we face and reflect on a conundrum, which is that as an evidence-based think tank, we have to carefully research what's happened in the past, what are the intervention points that have transformed thinking around problems. And we also need to conduct experiments to see how current public and other citizens respond to various interventions to become part of an effort to decarbonize our behaviors of multiple scales, all of which we know we need to do to address climate crisis. The challenge is that none of the actions taken so far, we know from the scientists, are consistent with the nature of the problem, which means that we don't yet have the evidence for new policy innovations that have yet to unfold, that have yet to be applied, that have yet to be figured in some way to attempt to change future behaviors. So what do you do when the evidence you want to collect happens after the intervention, not beforehand? This is a real conundrum for those that rely on evidence-based policymaking that's happened at some point in the past, when the goal here is to change future evidence. So what we do at EYES, which is what we call the Institute for Environment Sustainability, IES or EYES, is that we think about how do you draw on that knowledge without being limited by it? How can you run new experiments that are more likely to have the effect that governments, the private sector and NGOs seek to achieve? And we do this in our institute through a term called anticipatory policy design in which you get all relevant knowledge holders into the room, you reflect on the range, the multitude of policy interventions that you might be able to intervene with in some way, and then you you run experiments that you think have got the best chance of succeeding so that you can be more effective and efficient in addressing these problems as quickly as possible. And this is important because the climate crisis the scientists tell us, really has about nine years left to undertake significant reductions in carbon emissions or the world faces what they call catastrophic effects on the ecology as well as on economic and social systems. And so how to engage in anticipatory policy design that creates policy innovations that can draw on a wealth of knowledge but change future evidence is the question to which Elias is devoting the bulk of its attention over the coming months and years. Is there a simple example that you could give us? There are actually many examples out there of policymakers who have taken this kind of action. And so I'll give you one example, one of the most successful cases that comes to us from Germany, but I can also give you cases that are closer to home as well. But this one is important because it involves a case of anticipatory policy design that happened around 15 years ago in which very forward-looking 
policymakers in Germany had a goal of changing the way consumers, individuals, and the public conceived of and thought about the climate crisis and their own role in helping decarbonize activities. So what they did is they said, okay, we would really like to generate increased public demand for low carbon technologies in the form of either solar power or wind generated power. And they knew that if the public could get more involved in these efforts, that could create both the political space, but also the economic demand for new technologies. But 15 years ago, it wasn't like today. And the public, while they were concerned about the climate crisis, were not as acutely aware of all of its dimensions. And so the government said, we don't want to simply respond to what the public is pressuring us to do now. We want to think about what the public wants us to do in 15 years. And so they created a really innovative policy design mix, as we call it in policy studies, in which they said, okay, we're going to give some incentives to homeowners to put solar panels on their rooftops. Now, this was Germany, not exactly the the sunniest place in the world, but they knew that politically getting support from the German public was really important for creating the space for decarbonization. So what they did is they created a policy in which they didn't just give subsidies to homeowners, they gave long-term contracts with that subsidy. So what they said was, dear German homeowner, if you put a solar panel system on your rooftop, we're going to give you um, a subsidy every year to offset the cost of that solar installation. And we're going to give you a contract that tells you we're going to pay you every year for the next 20 years to do so. Now, shifting a subsidy into a contract form cost the government no more money, but it made the intervention much more durable because future governments, to change it, would have to pay compensation costs to those homeowners that purchase those systems. And that would make that unlikely to be reversed. And then the government said, oh, hey, German homeowner, if you now produce, and this is the really interesting part, if you now produce more energy than you consume from this system, we're going to pay you for that energy, not at the wholesale rate, but the retail rate, the higher retail rate that the market was demanded. Well, those two design tweaks, retail rate and contracts, not just subsidies, meant that this policy was not only sticky, over time, it became more and more entrenched and more and more Germans called for participating in the system. Why? Initially, it was for economic reasons. The more Germans could wear jackets and keep their temperatures down, the more money they made. And then as they did this, their neighbors saw their German neighbors making more money by wearing jackets and having solar panel systems. And they then demanded for the system to expand beyond the initial population. But of course, over time, this shifted from an economic incentive to a cultural practice. Germans were now practicing responsible behavior by having solar panels on their rooftops. And by then engaging in low-carb behavior internally, they were also generating norms of responsibility individually and collectively. Now, you all know from Economics 101 that the more demand there is for solar panels, the more companies emerge to meet that demand. And the more companies emerge to meet that demand, the more the costs come down over time owing to a lower production cost. And this is exactly what happened. You've got the politics changing, the feasibility changing. Germans now supporting the system for moral and normative reasons, no longer simply economic reasons. But companies then emerge to provide this demand. Now, the best part of this whole story is that this policy design mix, this policy lever that happened 15 years ago, becomes so strong and entrenched that now if you're a German citizen and you don't have a solar panel on your rooftop, you're considered not to be an appropriate citizen, okay? But it gets even better. Other countries saw this system, what is known in the global world as a feed-in tariff system, but it's this unique policy mix. Other countries saw the system and went, oh, this is really cool. And flash forward 15 years later, 160 jurisdictions all over the world 
have adopted some four of this kind of system that Germany first introduced. And now we have, without any global convention, without any requirement that countries do so, most countries now have some kind of system similar to the one Germany unleashed. So in eyes, we think, okay, that German example is a great metaphorical example. The evidence that norms changed into the future happened 15 years later, which means that the German policymakers couldn't rely on empirical evidence of that change that would have been too late to inform the design. But they could anticipate, they could anticipate that design impact having on German norms and German politics 15 years later. And they did that through thinking about the multiple steps that a really smart design might unleash. So we now see this happening in the context of, for example, Singapore, within the context of ASEAN. In the last three or four years, the Singapore government has initiated a number of efforts to decarbonize its sectors from transportation to shipping, to consumer behavior, to production and consumption of energy systems. All these things are happening out in Singapore. And eyes can play a role in generating design insights of the kind I mentioned in Germany. Little tweaks here and there that seem innocuous, contracts instead of subsidies, that could make the difference in whether or not we as members of Singapore community, members of the ASEAN community, or global citizens achieve these 1.5, 2 degrees warming goals set up in the Paris Accord. But it's a very exciting time. And that example is one that's now playing out in multiple spaces. But whether or not we design smartly enough depends upon generating knowledge collectively around these challenges. It's really encouraging to hear how some smart design and these sort of small tweaks can have such a great effect that will propagate around the world. And I think it's a good stepping off point for my next question. I wanted to refer to something that Dr. Vinod Thomas said recently at the launch of his book, Risk and Resilience in the Era of Climate Change. He said, having lost decades of inaction, now the time has come when transformative change alone can move the needle. It's not enough to do marginal incremental changes, which are the comfort zone of economists. What do you think about that quote? Yeah, I think it's a really important quote. Let me say, Professor Thomas's book was a wonderful analysis on both the urgency of the questions we're facing, but also the policy tools available to us to achieve these kind of changes. But I would say the following. A lot of talk is on transformation right now, but actually, there's some things we don't want to change at all we want to maintain. So for example, almost all countries of the world have adopted the Paris Accords objectives of limiting warming to no more than 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above natural levels. So that objective, we don't want to actually transform at all. That's an objective we want to meet. So we want to, therefore, transform our behaviors, our policy tools to achieve and maintain these objectives. But this connection between what we want to be resilient, the 1.52 degrees objective, and what needs to be transformed then becomes a really important distinction to be made in where we go to seek transformation. And while it's true, we can't do things slowly. With my colleagues, Levin, Alden Bernstein, the four of us developed this term, climate change is a super wicked problem. What we did say was that transformation will almost always occur through multiple step processes. So a German example is a really good one. It begins with an economic incentive. It ends up with a normative change through multiple steps involving companies, norms, and cultural shifts over time. So this means that transformation and incrementalism aren't necessarily at opposite sides of the coin. If you think about multiple steps that are fast, each of which have their own logics, but then going from step to step can lead to that kind of change that you want in the tools, in the behaviors, to maintain, not transform the objectives we seek to realize on the ground. Thank you. I think that's a really important distinction and a, a nice holistic context to put that in. Now I'd like to go back to something that you mentioned before when you were speaking about ASEAN and Singapore and Asia as being pivotal actors in the world's climate discussions, actions, and contributions. Can you share more about the possibility of I's role as Asia's new think tank on evidence for research and climate change policy initiatives that are working in this side of the world? There are a couple of key points I want to make here. 
One is a geopolitical point and one is more of a policy design point, but they're related. So in the geopolitical point, not many people realize or they've long forgotten the following statistic. If you ask the question of all the carbon dioxide sitting in the atmosphere right now above natural levels, how much was put there by northern countries? What the old Kyoto Protocol referred to as Annex 1 countries, those in the north that have largely developed. The answer is 92% of that carbon was put there by the north. So geopolitically, Asia and Southeast Asia have a role in generating awareness of that kind of information because it means that the north has to accelerate and double down on its efforts just to get to a level where ASEAN and other countries have yet to go. So the responsibility question becomes really important because right now, geopolitically, much of the focus on decarbonization is from the North on China, on India, and and also for that matter in Southeast Asia. And while, of course, you want attention everywhere, what you don't want to do is inadvertently reverse the arrows about where responsibility and acceleration of activity has to dramatically occur. And so geopolitically, one thing I want to do is generate kind of cross global conversations where we invite the North to the South and invite the North to Southeast Asia to understand better rallies in the ground here and responsibilities about the climate crisis as well. What we have right now is we have a lot of attention on what is known as these days as carbon border adjustment taxes, where essentially countries in the North are putting taxes on goods from the South where they feel that a country that's produced those goods hasn't done enough on the climate case. But that gets a little bit confusing because the responsibility question is much more complex, especially as southern countries seek to develop. So that's one question and one point that eyes can play a role in generating deliberative and meaningful conversations around global challenges and local responsibilities. But the second is that just as there's recognition that Southeast Asia in general, and of course, Singapore in particular, is one of the most innovative places in the world, whether you're talking about economic development, social policy dynamics, and now, of course, activity on decarbonization. Just as Southeast Asia is innovative, there's a chance now to accelerate that innovation when it comes to decarbonization. That's very exciting because unlike, say, five, 10 years ago, there is now a not just a societal consensus, but intergovernmental consensus that things have to occur quick and, and swiftly to reach these goals. And so we can be involved then in these policy design tweaks that can accelerate these efforts happening at multiple scales, both within Singapore, across different sectors, and also across us here. Um, and that makes us for a very exciting place because it means linking cutting edge research on the evidence out there and the experiments that are being run, but cutting edge thinking about how you anticipate future impacts that have yet to occur, but that by bringing all of our collective knowledge sources together, from practitioners to government leaders to academics, we can indeed unleash and uncover innovative solutions. That's fascinating. And based on what you said, I'm going to skip ahead one question and ask you just to discuss Singapore, specifically the fact that it's smaller in size, but you know it's, it's still a major player and actor on this front. Could you give us a little bit more detail and background on that? What's fascinating about Singapore's approach and also in the context of ASEAN is that they're working very diligently to marry, just as the German government feed and tariff program did, economic incentives with decarbonization. So they work on, for example, how do you leverage green finance for decarbonization? Now, globally, again, green finance and the resources, public and private, committed to green finance is really significant right now. And Mark Carney, former head of the Bank of England, is behind these efforts globally. But how they get deployed and what they do and how they're drawn upon to decarbonize is where Singapore comes in and ASEAN, for that matter, in a really important way. And that's when the innovation in Singapore is so important to take that general interest and that general resources that are now making their way through the system and leverage them for effective results. You know, even our colleagues in the business school are developing a program on climate finance 
and ISH to be part of those conversations around the policy design aspects of climate finance to be, again, effective and swift. Likewise, a significant efforts within Singapore to help ASEAN decarbonize through nature-based solutions. This is a really fascinating project, again, housed at NUS, where natural scientists, biologists are looking at how forests store carbon and how then you could generate carbon credits to invest in forest conservation, receiving biodiversity benefits, uh, reducing carbon emissions, and also gaining livelihoods as well. That's not an easy question. People have tried before, and the complex mix required to have effective and durable results is very challenging. But when you get significant minds together, including the public policy design aspect of these questions that ICE brings to the table, I think is where the action can actually happen. But there's a multitude of efforts underway from how you generate clean drinking water to how you reduce plastics, all of which have some component that could help as part of a broader process, decarbonize across multiple, multiple scales. Professor, you mentioned ASEAN. Could you elaborate a little bit further on what kind of collective action ASEAN could take? Yeah, this is a really important question because all over the world, countries are forming mini clubs of like-minded countries and organizations to facilitate their approach to decarbonization. The reality is Singapore is part of ASEAN. ASEAN is a very unique region. And a lot of efforts to decarbonize in this part of the world will require an ASEAN-wide response. Just for example, take technologies aimed at what's known as carbon capture and storage. These are emerging technologies, but they hold some potential promise to be part of a decarbonization solution. But the storage part of this has to occur outside of Singapore. And this means that some kind of collective cooperative approach on the part of ASEAN countries can really generate innovative ways to decarbonize that you couldn't do by your individual country level efforts. Likewise, and this is a really important point, even sources of green energy vary across countries. And so cooperation can help um, accelerate the sharing of, of decarbonization activities where different countries have particular advantages. Just for example, it turns out that Singapore has no rivers that it can dam for hydro power. Other countries do. That's simply a natural endowment. So if you want to think about what Singapore can do on the hydro side, that would mean some kind of agreement to import hydropower from other countries, be it Vietnam or Australia or, or Thailand for that matter. So that requires cooperation. And that's a really important part of the story because you wouldn't want to compare Singapore to a country that has vast abilities to tap into hydropower. So let's cut the technological solutions that also require financial incentives ultimately required a geopolitical response. And the linking of those knowledge sources, geopolitics with technology and finance, is a really important part of developing what would either be an effective cooperation agreement or one that ultimately doesn't succeed. What about the financing and investing that needs to take place to support this? What are your views on that? What would you like to share about that? Everybody in ASCII now looks to this potential of financing or both the adaptation and mitigation side of the climate crisis as something that can benefit Southeast Asia. Um, but the problem is, how do you do that in a way that attracts capital and deploys it most e- efficiently and effectively? And that's where I think Singapore has a competitive advantage because it's known as a place in which innovation occurs. It's a financial hub and it's known as a place with good governance. And so you know that the resources that are allocated through a Singapore climate hub are likely to be deployed the most effectively uh, with the least administrative costs compared to other places because there are so more advanced on that side. Not to mention, of course, the intellectual capital of Singapore being a financial hub in itself. So there, of course, you want to think about each country's value added and how you can draw on these resources to be effective quickly and efficiently. And that makes Singapore well-suited to both doing things internally, but also showing other countries how it's done. Uh, so they can also join in this decarbonization effort that can link these and mobilize these resources to effective results. I would also add to that, the more that Southeast Asia can develop systems that are seen as being trusted, as able to deliver results, the more you can deploy the resources that are committed. So for both those reasons, this is a very exciting time for the deployment of finance from global sources and then deployed in the Singaporean context. 
But again, it needs to be done well and right and in an innovative way in which Singapore has the opportunity to go lead. There is so much going on here, and it's really interesting to hear your take on that. What is the biggest factor contributing to behavioral differences in action for climate change to happen? This is the challenge of choosing the one thing, because actually, even though we need to reduce the, the pollution causing global warming, of which CO2 is the main pollutant, the actual causes are so multitude and across so many sectors that it's hard to identify one thing in particular, but rather how do you generate awareness about them all in common purpose? So whether it's how we think about the aviation sector, including how we as individuals fly to wonderful places to go on vacation, to how we think about shipping, and likewise, how we use public transportation or ride sharing, each one of these choices matters in some way. So that means, of course, you must have this awareness of the problem out there at not just the public policy level, but also the societal level. And what I can say is we're so far advanced from what we were 15 years ago. You know, when Al Gore came out with his, his presentations on the climate crisis, that was a very different world. And now we've got massive understandings uh, that this is a crisis that might be again as an ecological one, but that if not solved, is an economic one in the future. So how we do that and generate knowledge about that is now way more advanced. And of course, it means education continuing. It means dissemination of knowledge quickly and efficiently is important. And all those things are actually underway. But more importantly than information alone, to me, is what can we do as individuals, as members of society, and as those who are part of governing systems that seek to ask our government leaders to take action? And so in the context of Singapore, I would say one thing individuals can do is to support and encourage the activity that's already happening right now at multiple scales. One thing we know from our work on policy studies is that oftentimes policies aren't durable because the attention spans wane or relax. So maintaining awareness of and support for these kinds of policies is one significant step that individuals and, and citizens can make. But likewise, there are things that we can all do individually on our own. The products we purchase, the trips we make, our own behavior can play an important role in generating support and a collective vision. Exactly. Thank you so much. Well, I may just say one last thing, though. I think this is a very exciting time, but everybody around the world, citizens, government officials, nobody's Pollyannish about this. They realize, as you know, Thomas's book pointed out, the time is running out, which is the first key feature of super wicked problems. So this is not a done deal by any means. There's a lot of work to be done. And the crisis is getting more and more acute. So there's a chance here to do it well, but it means all of us have to recognize the severity of the problem and the deployment of capital, human, and financial and Design Insights is so fundamental now to assessing not whether, but how we can get this thing done. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think that was a really great discussion. My pleasure. Thank, thanks for taking the time and uh, really glad to be part of these conversations that require multiple languages and multiple knowledge sources and the integration of which uh, this kind of conversation helps advance. If you'd like to subscribe to the Globalization Newsletter, look for the link in the description or find us on Facebook at Global is Asian.